Welcome to Talk Purpose and Truth with Eden and Kim, shifting you into higher consciousness. The show that elevates, uplifts, and encourages listeners to grow, heal, awaken, and evolve. Eden and Kim include bold topics, special interviews with inspiring guests, intuitive readings, channeled messages from beyond, including celebrities, hot topics to expand your awareness, and time for questions from the audience. Tune in for unprecedented truth, authenticity, on purpose discussions, and magical moments. With no one, none of his friends knew who each other were. So when I came out after he died, I hadn't written about him in 26 years. And I wrote about him. I, I thought like 20 people would come out and, and they didn't. But a lot of people have come out and sort of said, oh, yeah, I, I knew Prince. Just we were like that. And a lot of people, there's a line in the big chill. I, I don't know if you're old enough to remember. You're, you're not. <laughs> but no. where um, it was from the 80s and a bunch of college, uh, it, there's like a college reunion and one of the guys says to William Hurt, um, they have an argument. We've known each other too long to get into an argument. He said, no, we knew each other um, a long time ago. We knew each other for very, we knew each other very well a long time ago. And there are a lot of people who knew Prince very well a long time ago. And I mean like 40 years. And I always tried to just keep my distance. It helped that I wasn't on his payroll. Um, yeah. He said in his Rock and Roll Hall of Fame speech, his advice to musicians is to have a mentor and someone not on their payroll as a friend. Yeah. So, mm. And so and there were many parts touch, of him. You stayed What's in that? touch with him though, right? You stayed in touch with him. Yes. And um, I think he respected that. I decided I didn't want to write about him anymore because that's all I was sort of was, oh, he's the Prince writer. He's the Prince writer. And I wanted to run away and join other circuses mm -hmm. sort of and write other things. And I think he kind of respected that, that I wasn't trying to live off of him. He said once I can make people famous for 15 minutes, but I can't make them famous for their whole lives. And they never forgive me, which was oh. an interesting. Ah, a lot of thing pressure. Yeah. Because you know, a lot of people who were quite angry. He wasn't an easy guy, I don't think. I mean, I yeah. was lucky. I was, I'm was. i glad I was never a musician working <laughs> at him. Um, right. But now that he's gone and he can't say, I haven't, I didn't talk to that guy for 40 years. Um, um, people are just coming out of the woodwork, writing books like me. And I'm no one to talk, but I'm glad it took, it just took so long just because it, it was hard. I just wanted to do right by him as a friend. And even that feels funny saying that because mm -hmm. I, I, for so long, it was like, no, no, no. And I hate reporters who conflate the importance of who they're interviewing with their own importance. You know, yeah. you, you can just tell they think like, oh, we you really know. hit it off. We're buddies. And it's, right. it's just the celebrity game. And I didn't want that. I didn't want to be one of those guys, especially with someone as difficult to know as Prince was. Mm -hmm. um, Trusted you, though, because you knew him from the time you guys were boys. Is that how, well, it was is that just, how you got to be his journalist? No, it was a coincidence. Um, oh. he's, he, had, he hadn't talked for three. Is this boring, by the way? Um, <laughs> no, it's if, fascinating. Uh, we have a lot of Prince-loving listeners. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, he hadn't spoken for three years and he said, I'm not talking anymore. This was, he said that before Purple Rain, Purple Rain comes out. And then he agreed to appear on the cover of Rolling Stone with Lisa and Wendy. Um, I remember that. And, and they would speak on behalf of him. And so I interviewed them and it was, went great, but I didn't say, Hey, could you talk to Prince and ask him? Blah, 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 blah. But, um, Susanna Melvoin talked to Lisa and Wendy and she convinced Prince that he should check me out. So I was living in New York then. And so I flew to Minneapolis and for two days, he didn't speak to me. He uh, just kind of like was rehearsing bands. We played ping pong and it wasn't until we started driving around Minneapolis that he even realized I was from, we were driving in North Minneapolis in his old neighborhood. And he said, now, 
there's a difference between North and South Minneapolis, yeah. North Minneapolis. And I in interrupted, I said, Oh, I know my grandparents lived right over there. And I mm. pointed because I used to spend every weekend two blocks away from where he grew up right uh -huh. next to the dip between. And, and I go, and I used to go sledding right at that hill. And so did he. And uh, so oh. it helped, but it wasn't the reason I don't think, but it's, it, it, I have it on tape and you can kind of hear the moment where he suddenly realizes, oh, this isn't just some New York sm smart aleck or whatever, you know? So well, we have, we have, um, we have two clips that you allowed us, um, oh, that one, huh? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. That <laughs> I, I, I think everyone's going to be shocked because there have never before, before heard clips that are not on the audio book or anywhere and only can be heard here of Neil with Prince, actual conversations. And so we're going to play two of them for our audience. So we're very, very humbled and grateful for this. It, I, I got really choked up listening. So, um, and there'll be like uh, 20 other ones on the audio book. Yeah, can the I audio book, book, you can buy the audio book and you'll get at least 20 oh. more. Yeah. yeah. What on is Amazon, it called? It's called This Thing Called Life. Um, 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 and I'm Neil Carl. So anyway, that's my plug. And yeah, uh, <laughs> we'll, plug it, we'll plug it again at the end. But uh, Scott, What's take it away. Name? But I hate. I'm so. I'm, I'm ashamed of myself. You know. <laughs> You're so funny. Keep like get, you know every five seconds in like closet where I kept just tapes of you know they're Wayne Newton tapes and share tape. You know just goofy tapes and that they still exist all these years later is is astonishing and um i couldn't the first year after i got this book assignment from um st martin's press i couldn't stand to listen to the tapes i spent the entire year reading everything that had ever been written about him except what i wrote or listening mm -hmm. to those tapes because i heard ghosts um and it wasn't just his ghost he was 26 and I was 25. Yes, this was once 25. And <laughs> I could hear my own ghosts, and I could remember what I was thinking in tw at 25 and what I thought life would be like. And, you oh, know, when you wow. go back in your head. And finally, um, I, I, I had to start listening to them. Actually, my, my apartment burned down, and I lost everything I had mm -hmm. except my Prince materials. Oh, it my God. Like, oh, it was no. almost like... I. And yes. the only reason I didn't lose them was because they were on a back. I wasn't home. They were on wow. my computer that I was wearing. And it was, you know, oh. some friends were saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty down to earth, but I, I, be I believe in don't, I mean, I'm open to anything. And it's, it was almost like he was going, pay attention, get to me, you know, oh my God. he gave me, I don't mean to like, mean, ah, he, he's the divine spirit, you know, but. Well, he is. <laughs> yeah. I, I was trying in four years I was trying to write about this loss I'd gone through and gotten four pages out you know um and suddenly I had something else to write about and it was such a relief to put my 60 books about suicide into boxes and put them away mm. for I knew a few years mm. not forever maybe not, I don't know but to just realize no I'm going to be focusing on someone else and yeah. uh, and uh, it was like a gift. It was it was his greatest gift to me. It was he he got me? Do, I felt like a phony when I'd say I was a writer because I wasn't writing. You know, it was mm -hmm. um, you know I had all that fancy sounding stuff that you read on that piece of paper. On unfortunately, we don't live life on paper. It would be you know. So yeah. Yeah, I said one thing that I think he called because he knew I was the only person up that late in Minneapolis who was willing to talk about depression and sadness and stuff like that. And he had a lot. Had so you got to talk to him about you. Sorry. You got to talk to him about that kind of thing, like something that was much deeper. So he got to be. Yeah. With like you. when I, I didn't like being around him or being around when he was being Prince superstar with his bodyguards mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. and, but he just seemed like a person, just like a person. And I'm not being 
disingenuous here. I'm truly incompetent at everything in life, be it Zoom or, you know, <laughs> sharpening pencils. But the one thing I'm okay at is getting heavy at 4.30 in the morning, you know. Um, I don't mean I'm some deep character, but I'm able to listen and, and relate to that. So it really was a guy. And um, it wasn't like we only talked on the phone, but as time went on, especially the last 15 years of his life, it was more and more, um, he would call at 4.15 in the morning. And I actually rubbed it in in my third Rolling Stone story because um, it started right away. I started the story with the phone rings at 4.48 a.m. Um, quote, hi, it's Prince. Did I wake you up? And it's like, that's how he'd always begin. And uh, uh, he just, he never, it seemed like he never slept. I always wanted to catch him in the act of sleeping. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and and I didn't. I, know, I now know when the hours he was just he was blessed but he was it was also sort of a torment to him mm -hmm. you know i'm That's so glad i'm not a genius. but he would talk about how he couldn't turn his brain off it was just yeah. no matter what he was doing just yeah. it was just ping 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 you know ideas mm -hmm. bouncing off and it and that's why he left so many songs but it's also it would wouldn't it drive you crazy if just i mean i know what that feels like to me and i just shut down but he it's couldn't hard. yes he, and so in a way it's like so sad that he left you know he, he he passed away so young but it's a blessing that he lasted so long in a way yeah With, having that he, tortured mind yeah yeah he didn't you know kurt coleman and, anyway i'm sorry you got oh the, okay um, well you guys had um you told us a story before about a pack yeah. a dying wish Pact that you guys have together. Yes, Can you explain that? and it's even been fact checked. I like to add that by GQ magazine, which ran it in this oral history. Okay. Um, but we, we, he, about three years before he died, we made we made an agreement about what the other person would do if the other person died first. And I was sure I was going to lose. The, I mean, not I don't know if you what you call losing or winning that bet. I was sure he was going to be play on stage at 93 like an old blues guy you know mm -hmm. muddy waters or bb king mm -hmm. and i'd get hit by a bus tomorrow or something you know i'm just such a dude and if i went first he agreed he'd play an hour after lunch at my high school here in minneapolis <laughs> and i knew he'd play for three hours and the kids wouldn't have to go back to go, go back to class and if he went first, which I sure would never happen, I'd just write one article again, and I hadn't written about him, for the hometown paper, mm -hmm. which is what I did. And those 12 pain, 100,000 people are going to die this year of um, opioid thing. It's a work-related right. injuries. You jump yeah. off speakers for 40 years wearing high heels, you're going to need double hip it's replacement crazy. surgery. And to yeah. think he did those incredible – he was in pain since after – Purple Rain. Um, wow. So when you think about how long his career, every step hurt. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I agony. couldn't do it. And, I just uh, got the word agony. That's yeah. what I feel like he was in agony. And I think it was also emotional agony as well. Emotionally. Yeah. Yes. And I think and that's people, why he played. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, just people, people, when you say that about um, people dying of opioids, and even anything related to mental health and needing something it's because there's not enough solutions out there and we have to be more understanding and empathetic with people going through that because it's a result of being in pain or anxiety or depression or whatever so they're not trying to just go yeah you know what let me just take all this stuff and and you know have all this stuff happen it's not that it's there's mental health there's stuff such pain. i think people right. it was just um national suicide awareness Day yeah. last, last week and um it's i mean people are getting better about talking about it but there is still a stigma for more information on eden go to edensustin.com for more information on kim go to kimlifecoach.com
Make sure to follow them on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Talk Purpose and Truth Podcast. If you loved this episode, you'll love every episode. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. Thank you for listening.